Good morning. Good morning, good morning. Welcome to Pocono Evangelical Free Church. We're so glad that you could be with us today. I uh, do have a few announcements to get through. I want to make mention that our online service is planned to be for 630 uh, I have a lot going on, so I'm a little concerned about actually accomplishing that this week. Uh, so <laughs> bear with us as we try to figure that out. But I'm going to do my best to have it on for 6.30 like normal. Uh, just pray for me that I can get it all done here. I uh, also want to make mention that we do have a congregational meeting coming up on January 30th. So that would be next Sunday. Uh, for those of you that are members, we really encourage you to be there uh, and, and uh, just be able to hear about what's going on in the church. Uh, if you're not a member but are interested in, uh, in just hearing what's going on, you're more than welcome to attend even though you can't vote. Uh, and if you're interested in becoming members, please see myself or my dad. We'd love to talk to you more about that. I uh, do also want to make mention um, uh, that uh, just for a few prayer needs, uh, continue to be praying for Janice uh, and the loss of Alan. Obviously, we're grieving as a church for that. Uh, just continue to be praying for her. And uh, I don't know if there's any details, Dad, that you want to share. Uh, yeah. The um, service will be at January 29th at Berean. Uh, there'll be a one o'clock visitation and then a two o'clock service. So and it'll be at Brian uh, Bible Fellowship. So uh, if you want any more information, come see myself or my dad on that. Uh, also want to make mention, uh, just be praying for Kim. Uh, her brother passed away. Um, and also uh, she's dealing with, obviously, her husband who is dealing with cancer. And they have to make some, some decisions. Uh, coming up. So just be praying for Kim and, and Paul and uh, and especially as they go through uh, the loss of Kim's brother. George, it's great to have you here. Uh, let's be praying for you. You have an, an operation coming up on Thursday, correct? Uh, so we'll, do you want to add anything else to that or? Okay, an operation. So, so it's, okay. it's just a very rare hernia. Very rare hernia. Yeah, okay. so something that you know, it's, it's something that the doctors don't see very often. Mm, okay. Give it to me. <laughs> well, we'll definitely be praying for you. And, and you. Uh, if you need anything, please reach out. So uh, we'll be praying for Georgia uh, as she uh, prepares for Thursday. Be praying for my daughter, Vera. Um, we're leaving for CHOP today, uh, uh, later in the afternoon, and uh, getting there right early for tomorrow morning where she'll have her surgery uh, for uh, to, to deal with the, her skull, uh, which she has craniosynostosis for those that don't know. Um, so just be praying for us in that whole process. It's going to be a long week for us, uh, lots of re recovery planned. and So just be praying for us as we go through some of the things that we're going through there. All right, with those things in mind, let's go to the Lord and worship.
basket in the back for tithes and offerings. Let's take a moment and go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we want to thank you that your mercy is greater than all our sin. Father, we know that we have wronged you. We have failed and we have transgressed your law. And yet, you sent your son. You sent your son to die for our sins. Lord, as we come before you today, I pray that our hearts would just be filled with gratefulness, knowing that your mercy is more because of what you, your son, Jesus, did for us. We thank you and praise you for that. Father, I do want to lift up the many things that are going on in our church today, uh, the many people that are dealing with difficulties, Lord. We lift up Janice to you in the midst of the loss of Alan, and Lord, we pray that you would uh, just uh, place your hand of, of comfort on her, Lord. I pray that she'd be able to, to just know your peace in this time, in the midst of grief and hurt, Lord. Father, I pray for the whole family, that you would just draw them close to you in this time. Father, I also pray the same for Kim in the midst of the loss of her brother, Lord. I pray that you'd be with, with her also ask for peace lord we also ask for wisdom in regards to the decisions they need to make in regards to her husband paul lord i pray that you would just give them wisdom and, and and guidance as to what decisions would be the right decisions at this time father 
Lord, thank you so much for Georgia. Lord, we pray that you'd be with her as she gets ready for this operation on Thursday. Lord, we ask that you'd be with the doctors as they handle this and, and deal with this, Father. I pray uh, that they'd be able to handle this very rare uh, hernia that she's dealing with, Lord. I pray that you just give them uh, help and, and be, with, be with Georgia as she gets ready for this, Lord. We pray for your peace there, too. Father, lift up Vera as well. Uh, also ask for... Uh, your help with the doctors as they uh, as they uh, do this uh, surgery, Lord. I pray that you would just comfort her little heart, Father, and Lord, help her to be able to not be scared. Uh, Lord, I pray that you would just help us as we care for her uh, afterwards, and Lord, I just pray that you would be with that whole situation as well, Father. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <laughs> Today's a special Sunday. I, uh, I'm officially getting ordained, and uh, he was so gracious and willing to come and, uh, and preach for us. So I'm so glad to have my friend Paulo.
Uh, just to give you a little background, Paul is the chair of the ordination committee uh, that uh, passed uh, Pastor JJ. I know Steve will be here a little later. Uh, both Steve and myself were on the council. I want to also say, Jack and Sue, it's so good to back, have you back from COVID. We've left all the Christmas decorations up because <laughs> Sue is one of the ones who really brings it all out, and uh, we'll be taking them down. But uh, we're just so grateful to have the two of you back and to see you. It's just what a blessing. So praise God. Uh, to have the two of you here today. Well, thank you for having me. It's good to be here. I've been wanting to come out this way for quite some time. It's just hard to get away from my own church to be here. But uh, this time I had an excuse. <laughs> and so somebody else is preaching at my church. And um, my family's there uh, at, at our church in Wantage, New Jersey. Some of you know that area. It's... Um, the ski area in that part of Jersey. Um, we live in a very pristine area as well. This is beautiful, uh, encircled by trees, it's gorgeous. We live in a more rural um, area. It is sort of mountainous, not quite like here, but um, where I am in particular, it's mostly farmland, which is rather odd for me. 24 years later, I'm still trying to get used to it. I am a city boy by nature. I was born in a huge city in Sao Paulo, Brazil, as we would say, and um, we moved here back in the mid-60s, and I've, uh, and we stayed. And so I'm married to an American woman, her name is Lisa, I have three sons, and there we live in that rural community, but I always long to get a little asphalt under my feet. <laughs> so up until COVID, in fact, the, my way of relaxation is to meander through New York City. And I find it very entertaining and exciting. And although I find myself also shaking my head like that, like, I also, apparently I like it because I keep going back. But COVID has changed. Uh, that city has changed life for many. And, um, and so we've been staying put for the most part. Haven't really ventured much in that direction. So um, um, as I said, my wife is um, back in Jersey uh, with my only son who's home at this point. I have one son who's married with a daughter down in seminary in Orlando, Florida. I, we don't get to see them too often, although my wife will be there later this week with one son. And um, it's just wonderful to watch a little granddaughter run around on video and, and or on FaceTime, uh, the cutest little thing. And I have another son who's now living in England, who's working with an evangelistic outfit called Speak Life UK. And it's amazing how much gospel the United Kingdom has forgotten. Mm -hmm. And it's almost as if they're starting all over again. Mm -hmm. uh, what a shame, isn't it? The land of Spurgeon now does not understand or know any of the gospel whatsoever. And so they're starting at a very basic level. In fact, he's working at a church there, an Anglican church he was assigned to, and doing what, um, what Pastor JJ was just doing, leading in music there, uh, a grand building that endured World War II bombing in Eastbourne, the very southern part of uh, England, just as where the, uh, the German airplanes after their Blitzkrieg would fly back to Germany through Eastbourne, over Eastbourne, and would unload all their bombs there in that town as they made their way um, back to their home. And um, there's my son sharing the gospel there, mostly through audio, uh, digital means. And, and he's enjoying it, although it is an internship and he's finding that adult life is not as simple as he thought. <laughs> the demands of the internship are significant, but he is enjoying life there. And I have a 16-year-old at home as well. And uh, just recently, he just surpassed me in height, which you're thinking, well, that's not such a big deal. <laughs> it is a big deal to me because now I'm the shortest in the home. <laughs> and he's the only redhead Brazilian I've ever met. <laughs> We've been pastoring at the Hope Evangelical Free Church now for um, 24 years. Uh, God has been very good to us there. Uh, God has uh, blessed us with a community of people who love the Word of God, who love Christ Himself. Uh, and whereas church work is never done, as your pastors can tell you, as you know yourself, it is wonderful to be in that field where we are simply sharing the Word of God, teaching the Word of God, to people who take interest, to people who are longing for nourishment for their souls. I do serve, as uh, your pastor mentioned, 
uh, and the board of uh, the district board of ministerial standing, whereby uh, we examine pastors for licensing and then ordination. And I must say, your pastor JJ did a wonderful job uh, uh, four years ago uh, when he was being examined for his license. And he was nervous, though, I will tell you that. <laughs> but most people are, right? To sell. But uh, a few years later, when he was just recently examined for his ordination, uh, he was much calmer. He, he knew what he was talking about. He was assured of his convictions. You know, we're not really looking for opinions. We're looking for convictions. I find that many people have opinions when it comes to the scriptures. And opinions, I suppose, are good. But, you know, opinions are easily changed. Show me the facts and you can change my opinions. But in order to change my convictions, you have to change me. And when it comes to ordination, we're looking for what are your biblical convictions? What are the convictions that, that mold your creed? What are the convictions that mold your character? Show me your calling. And that's what we examined for about four hours, a group of around 10 men, including uh, um, JJ's father, he was pretty cruel. No, no. <laughs> you were very, but you were just. <laughs> you were not easy on your son. Uh, but uh, but it is, I think, at times a very grueling examination. And certainly, it can be. And your pastor did very well, very well. And it was good to be able to see uh, how, over the years, his uh, ideas, his opinions turned into convictions by which he stands for, stands with, defends them well, and although some of us try to change his convictions <laughs> to see where he would go, he did not. Knowing then that he is serious about what he claims in the scriptures. And so it was good. And it is with honor that I would participate in this process of ordaining him. You know, the church ordains the pastor. However, within the Evangelical Free Church, we hold and give the credentials. And so it is certainly a partnership between uh, what you are doing and what the denomination is doing. And it's a good partnership. You are not alone. Uh, you, you have a, a multitude of people of like mind and heart who are holding the rope together in pro the proclamation of the Word of God in our region. And it's a good thing. It's a good thing. I, as a solo pastor in my small church in the country, I find a great amount of solace in knowing that I'm far from being alone. Far from being alone. And so, again, it is my pleasure to open the Word of God to you on this occasion. And I would invite you to open to the last chapter in the book of Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 13. We are not quite sure as to who wrote the book of Hebrews. There is various ideas, some speculation. And personally, I would like to know who, but it really doesn't matter. It is still God's word. It is truth. And, and Hebrews in particular has for us some very in-depth truth. Now notice I'm skipping all that. <laughs> and I'm going right to chapter 13, the very last chapter. And this is how it reads. I'll begin at verse, let's say, 10, and I'll read through verse 17. We have an altar from which those who serve the tent have no right to eat. For the bodies of those animals whose blood is brought into the holy places by the high priest as a sacrifice for sin are burned outside the camp. So Jesus also suffered outside the gate in order to sanctify the people through his own blood. Therefore, let us go to him outside the camp and bear the reproach he endured. For here we have no lasting city, but we seek the city that is to come. Through him, then let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God, that is, the fruit of lips, the acknowledgement of his name. Do not neglect to do good and to share what you have for such sacrifices are pleasing to God. Obey your leaders and submit to them for they are keeping watch over your souls as those who will have to give an account. Let them do this with joy and 
not with groaning, for that would be of no advantage to you. Let me pray. Our Heavenly Father, we are grateful for you are the God who calls us to yourself, the God who calls us to serve you. I pray, O oh Lord, that as we examine your scriptures this morning, that you would uh, give clarity uh, on my part, but also, Lord, clarity on the part of those who are listening to comprehend the depths of your truth, the importance of your word, and Lord, to take these truths and apply it to their lives in a way that would bring glory to you. In your name I ask. Amen. Amen. What I would like for you to see this morning are two things. One is um, a charge to you as the church. And then I thought it would be fitting that I would address my attention to JJ. In fact, at that point, if you want to leave, you can. I know what you do. But I'll be speaking primarily to, to Jay. And what we see here in, in the first few verses that I just read to you, that there are six sacrifices listed for us. Six sacrifices that are a charge to you, the Church of Jesus Christ, at this location. And it begins with verse 11. It's a sacrifice that the priests made at the temple for the bodies of those animals whose blood is brought into the holy places by the high priest as a sacrifice for sin are burned outside the camp. Now, I suppose we, if we had time, could go back and study the intricacies of that verse. But for this morning, I just want you to see that it's alluding to the sacrifices that priests made outside of the, the camp. A sacrifice. That's number one. But as I said, there's six. Verse 12 lists number two for us. And it says, So Jesus also suffered outside the gate in order to sanctify the people through his own blood. There is a second sacrifice. Not the sacrifice of the Old Testament, but the sacrifice that marks the New Testament. The sacrifice on which our gospel is, is all about. Uh, here is the sacrifice that Jesus Christ made on Golgotha outside of the city walls. And in fact, the sacrifice of verse 11, the Old Testament temple, was a picture of verse 12 of what Jesus Christ would do outside of the city on Golgotha as he sacrificed his life on our behalf. In fact, the Old Testament sacrifice has no meaning whatsoever unless we see it through the lens of verse 12, the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. The value of the Old Testament sacrifice was that it was a type, a picture, of what Christ would do for us. Mm -hmm. Aren't you glad that you live on this side of the cross? Mm -hmm. Praise God that he knows when and where we would be born and where he would lay us, mm -hmm. where he would place us. And I thank the Lord that I live on this side of the cross, mm -hmm. even as times are changing. Romans chapter 3, verse 21 reads this way. The law and the prophets bear witness to it. To what? To the righteousness of Christ. And, and likewise, in that same chapter, Romans 3, verse 25, it speaks about how God used those Old Testament sacrifices. Look at what it says. Whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. Mm -hmm. This was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance, he had passed over former sins. In the Old Testament, God was still saving by faith. But he used that Old Testament sacrifice as a means by which he would, he would delay judgment of the sins of the people. Knowing that one day, in due time, at just the right moment, Christ would be the ultimate sacrifice. But until then, this will be the replacement. This will be the substitute, the Old Testament sacrifice. So God withheld his judgment until then. And, and he applied, if you will, backwards into the Old Testament, the blood of Jesus Christ to those Old Testament saints. There's a third and fourth sacrifice listed here, in verse 13 and then verse 15. The sacrifice of the people of God. We saw a sacrifice by the priests, the sacrifice of Jesus Christ himself. And here we have number three, 
you are to endure the scorn or the reproach that is so common to those who follow Jesus Christ. That's verse 13. You are to endure the scorn that is so common to those who follow Jesus Christ. Now, honestly, in our world, we have not really endured much. Maybe people have snickered at you because you pray before you eat in, in public. That's really not scorn. Maybe you've lost a job because you refused to work on Sunday because you said, you know, on Sunday I'm going to the Lord's house. That's all there is to it. And you lost your job. Well, I'm sorry, but that's really not scorn. It's unfortunate. I was just reading this week uh, of uh, a young girl who just you know, maybe a, a, few year, a, a few years ago now, I think it was 300 girls from a, a Nigerian Christian school. It was a large number of girls from a Nigerian Christian school were kidnapped and taken away by an Islamic group. Mm -hmm. And what I learned recently is that all but one were released because all those girls denied Christ. But the one girl who refused to deny her faith in Christ is still kidnapped, still a slave, and now dubbed a perpetual sex slave. And the Nigerian government now is working finally to free this girl. But she refuses to deny Christ. Now there's reproach. There's persecution. You know, I don't know what's going to happen in our nation, but the winds are blowing in a different direction. Things are changing. But I do know this. When reproach does come, the Lord will be on our side. The question will be for us, will we be on the Lord's side? Here it says, this is your sacrifice that I expect, that you endure the scorn or reproach that will come to you because you are a follower of Christ. That's a sacrifice number three listed here, directed towards us. And here is the fourth sacrifice. It says, offer up a sacrifice of praise from your soul. Now that's what we were just doing a few moments ago. A sacrifice of praise. I remember many years ago, there was this uh, fella in my church. Uh, we were just singing that. Well, it, was, it was at the time a popular chorus. We bring a sacrifice of praise into the house of the Lord, right? And, and he got up and said, what is this sacrifice of praise? Praising is no sacrifice. I said, well, according to Hebrews 13, <laughs> it is. <laughs> a sacrifice of praise, meaning... That praising God does not come naturally. Mm. It's not that we're not grateful. It's that we're not grateful enough. That we are so accustomed to the goodness of God, the benefits of God, uh, that we take it for granted. And we lose a sense of gratitude. And where there's no gratitude, there is no sacrifice. Here it says, offer to God a sacrifice of praise from your soul, not only at 10 o'clock on Sunday mornings, but all the time. This is a sacrifice that you should be giving to God regularly. To the one who is continuously forgiving you, you should be continuously sacrificing praise to him. A sacrifice of praise. It suggests that it does not necessarily come naturally, does it? Whenever you use the word sacrifice, it means it's not coming naturally. You have to think twice. You have to place your trust in him. And you have to deny yourself. And that is not natural. Not to us humans. Even us Christians. You have to set yourself aside in order to make a sacrifice of praise. I'm speaking to a man who has been attending my church on and off for years now. And um, and he decided to pay me a visit a couple weeks ago. And he said, why do we sing so many songs? Can't we just get to the message? And, and the preacher wants to hear that, right? You're interested in the Word of God. But you know something? The reason he doesn't want to sing to the Lord is because he's got nothing to sing about. If he knew the better the blessings of God, if he knew the benefits of God, if he knew the salvation of Jesus Christ, he too would well up with gratitude and praise. Mm -hmm. I suggested that to him. He said, I'll think about it. 
verse 16, you see yet another sacrifice. Number five of the six. Here it says, do not neglect to do good and to share what you have. Now that's a sacrifice. Well, I can do good, but to share what I have, that's a sacrifice. Do not neglect to do good and, and, and to share what you have. And, and it, we're told why here. It says, for such sacrifices are pleasing to God. You see that verse 16? For such sacrifices are pleasing to God. They are pleasing to the person you sacrificed for. Yeah, obviously. But they're also pleasing and especially pleasing to God himself. When you sacrificially do what is good and you share what you have with others. And of course, the primary motivation should be this, to please God, not for brownie points. And I, I love it when people do good to others because of their destitute situation, condition. That's great. But listen, your primary reason for doing good, according to the scriptures, should be the character of Christ in you, to bring him glory. And when you're bringing him glory, I assure you, people around you are being blessed. You will do well by them. But it does require sacrifice. Matthew 5, 16 says this. So let others see your good works and give glory to God. Let them see your good works. Not so that you will be patted in the back, but so that God will be glorified. And then verse 17. Maybe the most difficult one of the sacrifices listed here because our day and age has radically changed. Look at what it says. Verse 17. The last sacrifice for you. <clears throat> Obey your leaders and submit to them. Referring to your spiritual leaders. Referring to your pastors. You, you know, most pastors have a hard time reading this verse in their church because it sounds so self-serving, doesn't it? That's why I took advantage of it. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Can the verse be any clearer? Obey your leaders and submit to them, for they are keeping watch over your souls as those who will have to give an account. Let them do this with joy and not with groaning, for that would be of no advantage to you. And now, if you go back to the beginning of the chapter, if you go back to chapter 13, verse 7, there it says, Remember your leaders... Those who spoke to you the word of God, consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. It says, remember those who in the past were your spiritual leaders. Consider the outcome of their life. Consider those people who were true, righteous leaders. Consider the outcome of their lives and then imitate them. Follow them. See who they were in terms of character, in terms of integrity, in terms of biblical conviction, and imitate those leaders. Here we're told not only to imitate them in verse 17, but we're told to obey your leaders, meaning follow their instruction. And then the word we, our culture no longer cares for is submit. Submit to their authority, to their spiritual governs to their spiritual authority. And then we're told why. It says, for they're keeping watch over your souls. They're keeping watch over your souls. Why should you submit to them? They're keeping watch over the soul. There, notice it says they, they, referring to your pastors and nobody else. This is not instruction for anybody and everybody. Here the context is speaking of those who are your spiritual leaders, your pastors. They are the ones who are keeping watch over your souls. Meaning that they are staying awake. They are being vigilant <coughs> to protect your soul. You know, a friend of mine, and JJ knows him as well, uh, pastors of a church. And right now, there's about 700 people uh, there. And um, and that's the case every week. And, uh, you know, in uh, small churches like yours and mine, we might say, well, you know, it would be nice if more people came. As I tell you, no pastor likes empty seats. We don't. For various reasons, some good, some bad, but we don't. But you know something? When I look at my small church, 
And then I look at verse 17. I say, thank you, Jesus. Because I don't have to watch over the souls of 700 people. You know how hard it is to watch over the souls of 700 people? That man needs prayer. Here it says that they are watching over your spiritual life, your deepest needs, your spiritual self, keeping watch. Jonathan Lehman describes a church as an embassy and the pastor is the ambassador. He is not the president. He is simply an ambassador and the church is the embassy. So that here we are living in a world that has nothing to do with the ways of God. But suddenly here, smack in the middle of this darkness, are the people of God. Have you ever been to an embassy or a consulate? Uh, as I said, said earlier, I'm from Brazil. And on occasion, I have to go to the Brazilian consulate in New York City. And suddenly, as soon as I walk through those doors, I'm back in Brazil. Everybody's speaking the language I grew up with. It's the same accents, same gestures, same looks. And suddenly, I feel like I'm back in my homeland. We know what we're talking about. We have the same humor and so on. And, and here we are, as a church, in this darkened world, but we're the people of God. And, and the pastor's authority is in that he is to represent simply what God has said. He doesn't come up with his own things, his own rules, his own orders, but rather he simply represents, like an ambassador in an embassy, what God has already spoken. And his job is to affirm who is a confessor and to affirm what is a right confession. Who is a confessor and what is a right confession? He's watching over your soul. And because he's doing that, we're told here that you are to, to follow and submit to them. And, and the pastor has this great motivation for doing this. Look at what the motivation is. Verse 17, he will have to give an account to God for your soul. Your pastors have to answer one day to God for how you conducted your Christian life. For how you lived in this world while under their spiritual authority. Whether or not you matured. Whether or not you fled from sin. And how they worked with you, how they discipled you, how they fed you the word of God, how they cared and nurtured you. They have to give an account, as I do, for my people, my sheep. And so look at what verse 17 says. Therefore, let them do this with joy and not with groaning. It's a sacrifice on your part, remember. Remember. To do what we see in verse 17, obey your leaders and submit to them. That's your sacrifice. But it says, do this. Why? So that they will be leaders in your life with joy and not with groaning. In either case, as your pastor, he is going to have to shepherd you. Whether he's groaning or with joy. He's going to have to shepherd you. And it says here, do not make him shepherd you begrudgingly. Do not make him say, oh, not again. You? Do not make him have to chase you down like a wandering sheep and deal with the same issue over and over and over again. But rather... Obey your leaders and submit to their spiritual authority. So that it will be a joyous workout for him, not a matter of groaning. You see, how you respond to his ministry, to your soul, 
is going to determine whether his work is a joy or a sour groan. It's very much dependent on you. But keep in mind, if your pastor is forced to shepherd you with a groan in his soul, that will be of no advantage to you, is what verse 17 says. Oh, he'll still have to shepherd you, but it won't be to your advantage. So make the right sacrifice. Make the right sacrifice. Very good. Those are the six sacrifices, of which several are very much for you as a church. Well, let's take a look at what this passage also says in regards to the pastor. And I'm going to stick uh, to what we've read there in verse 17, but also beyond that. And so, JJ, let, let me speak to you. Whereas the, the duty of the church is to uh, obey and submit to spiritual authority according to God's word, the duty of the pastor is to be faithful and to teach the word of God. Now, in principle, that's simple. But in practice, it can be extremely difficult. To be faithful, to teach the Word of God. Well, to be faithful, if you go back to verse 7, 13, verse 7. To be faithful means that the congregation will be able to look backwards one day and say, Oh, I remember Pastor JJ. I remember him as my leader. I could certainly speak well of him in terms of his character and his fidelity to the Word of God, his fidelity to his family. And I can consider how he lived and imitated. That's your goal, Jay. That I would be able to say, as the Apostle Paul said in 1 Corinthians 11, 1, follow me as I follow the example of Christ. It should be the goal of every preacher. 2 Timothy 4, 5 reads this way. As for you, always be sober-minded. Endure suffering. Do the work of an evangelist. Fulfill your ministry. Paul is writing to young pastor Timothy in Ephesus. And again, he says, as for you, Tim. Timmy, don't forget. Your job is to always be sober-minded. Be level-headed. Take serious the things of God. Endure suffering. The two often come together. Endure suffering. And do the work of, of an evangelist. In other words, preach the gospel to those who don't necessarily want to hear it. And fulfill your ministry. Fulfill the duties of your calling. Never forget that the call for holiness, as we see in 1 Peter 1.16... It's not just for the church, Jay. It's for you. Be holy as God is holy. It's not just for the church at large. It starts with the pastor. And so, teach the word of God. There is no portion of the Bible that should be omitted. Even Song of Solomon. There is no biblical text which you should not aim to understand. There is no verse that you can say, oh, that's antiquated, that's irrelevant. Uh, there's no portion of the Bible that is not when it's properly understood. No portion of the Bible is not applicable. All of it is for us. Teach the entire counsel of God. Never forget to depend on the Spirit to give you understanding. In a conversation with a friend, he was astounded because uh, a, a pastor of a mega church said, you want a church of 20,000? I can do it for you. And I can do it without the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. Not a shame. And he did. And then that pastor said, I've done it before, but I'll never do it again. He learned. As he was retiring, he learned, I'll never do it again. Oh, but the damage he caused in the process. Preach the entire word of God. Resist the temptation for gimmicks. <laughs> There's sure plenty. Focus on the work God is, has entrusted into your hands, even if it may be eclectic, even if it may be overwhelming. 
never compare yourself to others. That will never do you well. For then you will either be disheartened and you're going to want to give up or you'll become proud and you should give up. And John Calvin taught young pastors and he charged pastors saying this. I'll read it to you. <clears throat> Let the pastors boldly dare all things by the word of God. Let them constrain all the power, glory, and excellence of the world to give place to and to obey the divine majesty of this word. Let them enjoin everyone by it, from the highest to the lowest. Let them edify the body of Christ. Let them uh, devastate Satan's reign. Let them posture, pasture the sheep. Let them kill the wolves, instruct and exhort the rebellious. Let them bind and loose thunder and lightning if necessary, but let them do all according to the word of God. JJ, Calvin was writing to you. You will have to give an account. If God promised blessings to those who are his under shepherds, as, as we are, if that blessing is not enough motivation for us, if the honor of God is not motivation enough for you, then let this be a reminder to you. You are going to have to give an account to God for your church. For your church. And that could either scare you into action or compel you to willingly and lovingly feed the sheep. Never underestimate God's prescribed means of feeding your sheep. The proclaimed preached word. You know, my son, when he was 19 years old, he's only 25 now, um, had the opportunity to go with a professor from his college and uh, R.C. Sproul to a conference where the professor and Sproul were going to be preaching. And, and when it came time for the professor to preach, as he was announced and introduced, he gathered his papers and he realized he forgot his Bible. That could be a problem. And he turned to my son and said, Tyler, I forgot my Bible. Can I borrow yours? And so my son gave him the Bible. The professor preached. And then it was time for R.C. Sproul to preach. And R.C. Sproul was introduced, and he's quite the character, quite the theologian. Mm -hmm. And he gathered his papers together, and as he was approaching the pulpit, he said, I forgot my Bible. And he turned to Tyler and said, can I borrow yours? We all make mistakes. No question about it. But what I do appreciate about Sproul is that as he approached the pulpit, every time he preached, this is what he said to himself. This is what he said to himself. Now, this is a theologian of theologians. This is not always agreeable. But the man knew the scriptures. He would have to remind himself as he got behind a pulpit that this is how God changes lives. Through the simple proclamation, the simple preaching of the word of God. And he would just keep telling himself, this is how God changes lives. This is how God changes lives. This is God, how, how God changes lives. And Sproul went on to say, he mentioned to me, that the reason... He didn't get into the pastorate until at the very end of his life, the last 10 years or so, was because he was too thin-skinned. Up until then, he was just a great theologian. But too thin-skinned to be a pastor. The challenges of the pastorate are great. Sometimes because of the church, sometimes because of the world, sometimes because of our own doings. But preach the word of God. Let me quote to you from John Piper in regards to what happens when God's word is preached. He says this, Remember the supernatural here. This is not just a religious tradition. God is here as we worship together. People pass from death to life in this room. Saints are made strong and enabled to weather the assaults of the devil. God is receiving praise. This is a divine human transaction, which not only now, but in 10 years from now, 
will be at work saving your soul and preserving your faith. Elevate in your heart and mind the significance of corporate worship. Preach the word of God. So be faithful to teach, Jay. Be faithful to your family first and then to your church. And at the end of the day, when you lay your head to rest, remind yourself you are a servant of Christ. And two, think highly of the privilege of the calling that has been bestowed on you by God. Amen. Thank you so much, Paula, for coming and ministering to us today. What a, what a joy to hear the Word of God. Amen. Amen. And uh, what a joy it is today to, to have uh, Pastor JJ and to be able to um, officiate the ordination portion of the service. Um, often the, the district superintendent would be here. Um, I talked earlier with the district superintendent. He's out of the country, so he could not be here today. Um, but he would have loved to be here, and he sends his regard. Um, one of the district superintendents, Tony Bassamo, um, wanted everyone to know that. But now we're going to have the ordination service. Um, in a moment, I'm going to ask uh, one of our elders, who's also ordained, and Paul to come. And then we're going to do it again. I don't know if that often happens, but we're going to do it twice. Um, doesn't mean you're ordained twice, but this is all a part of it. Uh, but I want to I want to share with uh, Pastor JJ a charge to him. Uh, but before I do that, I want to read to you right from the Evangelical Free Church uh, uh, Ministerium uh, Manual. Uh, want to read what ordination is. It says ordination is recognition by a local church. Thank you for pointing that out earlier. By a local church of their pastor's calling and gifts. And then later on it says, it signifies a setting apart, a consecration to full-time pursuit of ministry in the church of Jesus Christ. Pastor JJ, that's what we are calling you to today, is to the pursuit of ministry, the consecration for the glory of God. And I want to read uh, two scriptures and just give a couple thoughts to you as we consider these scriptures. Thank you, Paulo, for already doing a little bit of my that, that to Pastor JJ and the fantastic charge to us as a congregation. Um, but first, uh, Timothy chapter 4 and verse 14 and 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 6 and 7 talk about the laying on of hands. We're going to have Pastor JJ come and actually kneel and the, the three of us and then there'll be a few more in the second service are going to lay hands on Pastor JJ. Uh, but Paul says this from 1 Timothy and then we'll look at from 2 Timothy. He says this from 1 Timothy to Timothy and I'd like to change it to Josiah to JJ, Pastor JJ, uh, he says to, to, to us as pastors, do not neglect the gift that is in you, which was given to you by prophecy with the laying on of the hands of the eldership. Now, I, I don't assume that, Paulo, you're going to be a prophet or I'm going to be a prophet or Steve back there, we are prophets, but we are pastors. We are ministers. And we see, Pastor JJ, the gift that is within you that God gave to you. And the first thing it says is, do not neglect. Word study says it's the negative. It's a compound word. It's the negative. And then it has this idea of having concern. So it says, make sure that you don't have this. <laughs> that you don't have not concern. Or not affected. Let the congregation impact your soul. Then it goes on to say in 2 Timothy, so Paul doesn't want Timothy to miss, understand this. He wants him to get this. And Paul apparently was a part of this, as far as most commentators think. 
And Paul, in 2 Timothy chapter 1, in verses 6 and 7, says, Therefore I remind you, so once again, Paul goes back to this laying out of the hands and this gift that is in Timothy, more specifically, Pastor JJ, the gift that God has given you to pastor his church. Therefore I remind you to stir up the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. This past year, Barna did, uh, in November of this past year, did a study on pastors. And the conclusion of that study was 38% of pastors in the past year seriously considered leaving full-time ministry. Can you imagine if that were to happen? That's obviously been accentuated with COVID and many other difficulties. As somebody who counsels pastors, I see the disheartened. Probably half of the, the many pastors I counsel have been disheartened to the point that they're ready to leave the ministry. So I see that to be true. And we need to stand firm, don't we? We need to be challenged. And Paul says, stir it up. So those moments when you're discouraged, Pastor JJ, stir it up. It means to blow on embers and let them fire back up. And in the ministry, we need that. In fact, this word is only used one time in the whole of the, the um, uh, New Testament. But he wants us to remember how important it is to stir this up. Uh, Thayer puts it, to be enkindled and to gain strength. There will be times where the stressors of the ministry will make you want to just give up. And we need to remind you, be enkindled, gain strength. Revive that spark, Jameson Fawcett Brown says. It's the opposite of allowing it to be quenched. So I want to close this portion by reminding you, as your father, one of your jobs when you were young you had to build the fires. You had to build the fire. That was part of your job. That was one of the things that you did. And, 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 and I remember um, thinking about it when I saw you last week building the fire. Because <laughs> I was in your house and there you were building the fire. And, 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 and how important it is to have the fuel of the Word of God to have the fuel of the Holy Spirit, to have the fuel, the passion of the ministry that God has called you to be stirred up. And so we challenge you to that today. Would you come, Pastor JJ and, 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 and Neil? I know that's not a little unusual, but I'm following the manual. <laughs> so we'll have you, Neil. And um, uh, Steve, who uh, was on his ordination council as a, a uh, minister, as well as Paulo, if you'd come and we'll lay hands on Pastor JJ. And Steve, I will ask you to pray at the end. Pastor JJ, these charges come from 2 Timothy chapter 4 and 1 Peter chapter 5. Preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Convince, rebuke, exhort with all long-suffering and teaching. Shepherd the flock of God, serving as an overseer, not by compulsion, but willingly, not for dishonest gain, but eagerly, not as being Lord over those entrusted to you, but being an example to the flock. Pastor JJ, do you commit yourself to these scriptural charges given to the pastor? I will. Thank you. As co-pastor of Pocono Evangelical Free Church with you, and as a member of your nation council, in recognition of the call of God upon your life to the pastoral office, in harmony with the Evangelical Free Church, Pocono Evangelical Free Church, and these men who are all on your nation council, uh, we confirm your gifts and calling as a pastor teacher. We hereby ordain you to the gospel ministry in the name of the Father, the name of the Son, and the name of the Holy Spirit. Steve, would you please pray for Pastor Gigi? <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we bow before you because we are humbled in your presence. This ordination, Father, is a, is a calling that you have given this young man to move forward in his life. 
in service of you. Lord, we we pray for him. There will be times of, uh, of difficulty ahead. There will be times of pleasant pastures. And yet, Lord, we, we pray for his family and his uh, life, Lord, that you would bless him, keep him, take care of his family and his and all that that is involved and help him be a good pastor to this flock Lord that he would be ready and available to them and Lord that you would always give him the strength that he needs to accomplish the task that you have given him we pray these things in Jesus name Amen. Amen. Pastor JJ, you can stand. Um, in closing, I just want to mention, uh, many of you have uh, signed the card. Try to make sure everyone signs it. We'll give that to you next in the next service. Uh, the card also has uh, a gift certificate for you. Uh, but I wanted to give to the con uh, in front of the congregation and also put it on. This is your certificate of ordination. Uh, signed by Steve and myself and the president of the Evangelical Free Church the, uh, and, and many others there. Uh, so we wanted to give that to you. And then I'll take it back for the second service. <laughs> but you're dismissed. Let's give Pastor JJ a hand.